Welcome to DaVinci Academy's Chapter 1 Molecular Biology, where we're going to discuss laboratory techniques. So first we're going to discuss what the Western blot is. So the Western blot is a test that's used to really study the specific presence of proteins. It's more of a subjective test, but it can be objectified. And it usually tests biological samples or tissue samples that are broken down. But like I said, it's very qualitative in assessment, like a yes or no answer is what you want to elicit when you do a Western blot but you can use a certain technique, as I'll explain later on, to make it more of a quantitative study. Probably one of the most notable examples of when Western blood is used in, just in terms of confirmation of HIV presence. So we're gonna kinda go over the steps a little bit with Western blots. So first what you do, is you take a sample or a tissue of interest. You let it go under a series of processes or enzymatic reactions to get it to a point in which you want to then study it. So it's kinda broken down. You take your biological sample, you combine it with a colored dye and you inject it into an agarose gel, either preformed or you make the agarose gel yourself. You put a standard in the left side, which is preset sample that will then differentiate according to molecular weights by colors so that you can compare what you get and what you known kind of molecular weight sized values are on the left side. So you inject it into the agarose gel and you let an electrical current run through it. And then what happens is all your samples and the standards will then run from top to bottom of the gel. So what happens is these proteins or these sample of interest will actually uh, differentiate themselves based on the size. So larger, larger molecular weight proteins will, will not be able to travel as far so they'll stay closer up to the top and proteins that are smaller will actually be able to travel further through the gel. And like I said before the standard is always placed on the left side so you can compare. But once you finish running your agarose gel, you then take it and you put it into what we call a sandwich. And it's sandwiched between different membranes, usually it's nitrocellulose blot membrane, and other sort of material based membranes. And you run another electrical current so you can transfer everything that's on your agarose gel, you can transfer it onto your nitrocellulose membrane. And what you do is you take this nitrocellulose membrane and you wash it with primary antibodies of interest. And this is the antibody that will bind to the protein that you believe may be in your sample. Then once you kind of wash that nitrocellulose membrane or blot with the antibodies, you have to wash it off and remove all that excess antibodies. Then what you do is then you add a secondary antibody that binds to that primary antibody so that you can then elicit a signal. And what happens is then you take that signal from the secondary antibody and you can use it to produce a visible intensity just as you would develop a, like a photograph from the old time you would develop a membrane just in the same fashion and that secondary antibody would then light up and, and kind of introduce this intensity. What's interesting about the Western blot is that, like I said, it's very subjective tests, like yes, no presence, yes, it's present at this molecular weight, but you can use densitometrics or densitometry to actually determine what the in intensity can extrapolate to the concentration. So it's very interesting that you can make this more objective by you know, scanning this new developed film of your nitrocellulose membrane into a computer and using specific software, you can determine the density of the signal or the intensity of the signal and you can create a concentration from it. But that's probably a little more advanced. Usually it's just determined yes or no. Is this protein present or not? So the next one we're gonna talk about is the northern blot. So the northern blot, it's honestly very similar to the concept of a western blot. You take your sample of interest, you place it into a gel you have a standard, you run electrical current through it, gel electrophoresis, and then you will stratify or differentiate the sample based on the RNA according to its molecular weight or size. And that's exactly the same thing. The difference is it doesn't take as long. There's no transferring of the gel to a nitrocellulose membrane, and then you can go ahead and develop it right away. But don't remember, just all you have to remember is that northern blot is specific for RNA. Western blot is specific for proteinaceous material. And the last one, southern blot, is specific for DNA. And it's pretty much almost exactly similar to what happens with, with the northern blot. It just runs in the exact same fashion, except now you're just studying for DNA. Over here on the right, you can actually see what it would look like if you had an actual sample. You can see the standard over on the right. You can see the wells loaded where you load on the top. The DNA migrates inferiorly from negative to positive charge. And you can see how it stops those, those intensity of the signals kind of they kind of stop over here and that kind of then you what you do is you can look and see what this is what this what this value is and then you know that this right here correlates to what this value is and that's pretty much how you use this so these standards 
say your protein's here or your DNA is here, or your RNA is here. You can use these values to tell you where you're at. What you do is say it's like five here or like 20 here, whatever it may be, arbitrary numbers. And you know, say example, that your value of interest is 20, then you're confirmed that yes, this correlates to what we're studying. So the next one we're going to talk about is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. And this is a very, very important test because this has a lot of different functions. It's actually used very widely in biochemistry. So this test is used to study protein, peptide sequences, antibodies, hormones, pretty much anything that is like almost peptide or protein in, in base because it, it uses the concept of antibodies, antigens, to actually produce this colors that you see here. So we're going to go over the steps a little bit. So there's different types of ELISA plates that you could have. You can have a solid ELISA plate, for example. And what it does is it exploits the concept of the interaction between antigens and antibodies. So you either have these antigens or antibodies that are adsorbed or stick to the plate like this. They stick to the plate itself. What you do is then you take the antibodies or antigens and you will mix them together in a solution. And this antigen-antibody complex will bind if it exists. What happens though is that you may have some unexpected binding like this and this and this does not necessarily mean that this is the correct interaction. What happens is you have to wash this off, get rid of any excess antibodies or antigens that are, that are, that are present so that you're left over with the true value of interest. Then what you do is you take like a biotin tar tag the antibodies, very similar to what happened in Western blot, to tag that antigen antibody complex. So then you can create the signal that you would then see on your ELISA plate. So this is a very interesting concept, but you, you have to understand that only the antigen antibody investigating should remain bound to the immunosorb. You, can, you need to wash it off. Like when I explain that Western blots and, and ELISA undergo a washing technique, it's, it's, it's essentially, as it states, it's washing this membrane, it's washing this, this, this plate because you need to make sure that you're getting the most specific binding possible so that your signal detection is as accurate as possible. So now we're going to discuss the polymerase chain reaction, PCR. So PCR, again, is one of those big game changers in, in a lot of different aspects in medicine and biochemistry. It's really used to pretty much only study DNA and RNA sequences. And it, it kind of exploits the concept of using known flanking sequences to figure out and amplify your target, even to thousands to the millions of, in, of, of times interest. So it has a lot of variety of functions. It can be used in viral genetics, it can be in, studied in cancer genetics, genome testing, and even very interesting in forensic science has been a really big role for this. So we're going to go over a little bit. So PCR really uses two very, very basic concepts. It uses the concept of a known primer and the concept of the use of a DNA polymerase to kind of elicit its function. So realistically, PCR just undergoes a series of very simple, like three steps, and it just repeats these steps over and over and over again to amplify the signal. And that's pretty much what happens in PCR. So here are kind of like the steps. So what happens in PCR is you take your DNA, your complete DNA of interest, so your target is in here somewhere, and you don't know necessarily, you don't know what it may be, but what you do know is you do know your primers. So what happens is you take your sample, you heat it up to a very high temperature, like 95 degrees, and what happens is the DNA will then separate. It separates like this, and what happens now is you have this open fragments that allow for DNA primers to bind to them. So you cool it down, allow this binding interaction to occur because they're present in the solution, and it binds here, bring, recruits in DNA polymerase, and allows polymerization of this new strand because you also have nucleotides present in the solution. And the DNA polymerase then it replicates in a 5' to 3' prime fashion. So interestingly enough, this process just keeps going on and on and on again. So you first have heating, you split it, the primers bind, nucleotides in the DNA polymerase are present, it causes new polymerization or synthesis of the strand, and what happens is it cools down again, and then it repeats this over and over and over again, millions of times until you are completely done with all of the nucleotides that are in the sample. Once that happens, PCR is complete. When that's complete, you can then use this information to figure out what you're studying. <clears throat> so the, probably the most uh, easily recognizable use of this is in forensic science or forensic medicine. Say a criminal performs a crime, you have a blood sample or you have a hair sample, you necessarily don't know what it is, but you also have such a low volume of it 
that you need to amplify it so that you can test it across the database. So you have a little bit of a hair strand, you have a little bit of a blood, and what happens is you don't have enough to actually test it because you just you, you don't have enough to, to run it across the system. You amplify it thousands or million times fold and you can then use it to compare. And that's exactly what PCR is used for in forensic science. So now we're going to talk about karyotyping real quick. So karyotyping is actually a really interesting concept and if you want you could actually like YouTube it or look it up and how it's actually performed. It's actually kind of neat how they drop it from a height and actually the chromosomes will just kind of spray out and you can visualize it. So it's actually pretty neat to see. But anyway, karyotyping is just the gross visualization or appearance of chromosomes and that's pretty much what it is. You're, you're kind of doing a bird's eye view looking at this and looking at how these look. And then from there you can figure out grossly if, if, there's, if it's normal or not. So it, it kind of has very limited functions, but it also has very important functions in diagnosing very specific certain disease processes. So there's kind of six overarching features that are looked upon when you look at doing karyotype. You look at the overall number of chromosomes, the position of the centromeres, say it's here or here. You look at the difference in size between two different ones. You look at the overall number, because if you have an extra one, it might be a trisomy. You look at the difference in position and number of the chromosome satellites. And then you look at the difference in staining pattern between heterochromatic or the non-active, remember that non-active, versus the euchromatin, which is the active. And probably the biggest reason why karyotyping is used is because it can determine these really, really pretty much classically described diseases. You can look at fragile X, so you can look at the X chromosome and see if it has, say, a little, a little strand hanging off in the end that could be fragile X. If you have an extra one, you could have trisomies. And it all, you could also look at this to figure out if there's Robertsonian translocation. So the last one we're going to talk about is fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is probably one of my favorite, also called FISH. So FISH is a very interesting technique in biochemistry that produces very colorful, lusher images because it takes a specific, specific piece of instrument to then capture the fluorescent glow that, that you use in these, in these biological samples. So what happens is you have these probes that are mixed into the cytologic sample to detect this nucleic, nucleic acid sequence. These probes in, in the cell mixture are then placed under this fl fluorescence camera and you can actually demonstrate the actual physical localization of these nucleic acid sequences. And you pretty much look at this for DNA or RNA sequences. You can also look at mRNA as well, which is often a big one. And the reason why this is so important is you can, you can do a lot of biochemical studying that you can't necessarily do with with like Western blot or Northern blot or ELISA because those are just kind of more yes no objective based questions like is this occurring is this present what what at what intensity but using fish you can actually see with your eyes how things are working in dynamic state you can actually take a static image like this on the right or you could use a fish movie or a fish video where you can actually see how the, the cells are interacting in an environment in a dynamic real-time environment so it's actually performed a very almost lifelike appearance of what's happening and you can use this to study crew to shaw prey to willy angelman cml ALL, a, a whole variety of different diseases and you can kind of figure out where the localization of these of these these interest interest targets are and figure out what the disease is so the fish steps are very basic it's very straightforward as well none of this is really difficult but it's very interesting so the cells are cultured and they're placed in a glass slide and what you do is you, you fix them. You, you permanently fix them and if they, so they essentially are dead because they're no longer alive. You fix them to a plate, you mobilize them and you put them in a certain detergent or solution that creates these little micro perforations in the cell membrane and in the nuclear membrane which allows the probes to then enter the cell or enter into the nucleus and you can then tag with whatever you're interested in and then it can glow. So you need to under, pretty much understand that. You have the cells, you put a little detergent, it creates perforations, the probes enter, tag your interest with a fluorescent signal, and then you capture it under a fluorescent camera. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, when you look over here on the right in the previous image, I mean, these are very beautiful images that you can see. This isn't the color that naturally exists, of course, within these cells. These are artificially produced colors, but nevertheless, they're actually very interesting to kind of see. And that concludes this chapter of Da Vinci Academy.